So in the last episode, we finally took possession of the building after the tenant leased back from me for the past 16 months. But in this episode, we've got a lot of work to do before we can finalize the building to bring machines over to get set up so we can start making chips. Let's get started. So here we are in the front office. Now keep in mind, this is all gonna be demoed. So that's why we're not trying to be careful trying to protect the walls or anything. We have resin, we have primer, we have the gloss as the top coat. We're minutes away from throwing stuff down. Let me give you a quick shot of what we got going on out here. So the epoxy guys have used the shot blasting machine to etch off the top layer of concrete. You can see it looks like it's a a finely manicured lawn. Now we're minutes away from putting down the primer. The primer is tinted the same color as the epoxy, so it's gonna be the most dramatic uh, contrast between concrete and the final product. So in that, cue the time-lapse montage. All right, so here we are, it's Monday morning. This is the first opportunity I've gotten to see the floor. It looks amazing. Now, uh, to stay on the timeline, the epoxy contractor came in, they wrapped up on Saturday. So we've had a full Sunday and Monday, 48 hour cure time. It's still curing, um, we can walk on it, we can do some light work on it. We are not gonna put any heavy equipment on this. Like the two lifts, we still have some work to do up high. So we're not gonna put any weight on this and definitely not move any machines in at all for quite a while. So we're gonna give it another week while we finish up some, uh, some little minor details. Uh, to that point, like the pole around me, they got a little bit of epoxy on it. They did a good job of cleaning it off, but we're gonna wanna touch that up with paint. Along the, the wall where the, where the wall meets the epoxy, obviously it's splashed up just a little bit as they squeegee it on and, and roll it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have another contractor come in and install vinyl baseboards. You see them in office environments uh, often, and you know, it's, it's, these are concrete walls. I would recommend it if you're going up against drywall, but it's just gonna add another layer of protection. This is a working shop. Walls are gonna get bumped, so we're gonna have that done. Uh, we also can put some ladders in place, not lifts, so we have some electrical, um, some bulbs to finish up. We'll wrap that up while we wait for the epoxy to have its final cure. Now, uh, more specifically, we went with a orange peel finish on it. Now, with most epoxies, you can put in flake, which adds a color. You can put in a texture, which uh, adds a little bit of slip resistance. We just went with just a standard orange peel. It almost looks like a textured wall. I did that for a few reasons. If you're working with small components, small parts, and you drop something and you have a colored flake in place, good luck finding it. You pretty much have to get down on the ground and look for that small uh, component. So whether we have fasteners or some of the screws we use, uh, I, just, I just didn't want to do that. I really love the clean, solid color look. Um, and as far as texture, so you can add texture for slip resistance. I'm not a fan of that because we clean our floors weekly and we have a walk behind uh, floor scrubber and texture. It just, it doesn't squeegee up the, the moisture, the, 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 the cleaning agent, the, whatever it's called, the soap, as well when it has a texture on it. Um, some machines apparently work better, not the one we got but um, orange peel gives a little bit of a slip resistance because it does have a little bit of texture on it. Um, and I didn't want glass smooth because when you spill something, the surface tension, like it just spreads. The orange peel is like that sweet spot between like a glass surface and a textured surface. I'm so blown away and super happy with how it turned out. 
Okay, we're right on schedule. Now over the next few days, we're gonna wrap up electrical and get internet hooked up so we can get the assembly and shipping stations set up to start processing orders from this location before we move over any machinery. So one of the things we had to tackle is how does a company with tens of thousands of dollars in daily orders stop shipping and then set it up in a new location without letting orders get behind? Well, we tackled it with two different phases. Now, any new components that we would machine immediately goes on pallets. Anything that's been machined and goes to anodize or plating goes on pallets. From there, we would move all of that raw inventory, pre-assembled inventory, to the new facility. Meanwhile, we deplete the inventory that's already assembled that was previously in this room. Now, my team moved over there, my assembly team moved over there. Once they reached a threshold of completed assembled components that was greater in number than the components that were here, that's when we shut this place down and we really only had about two hours of downtime when we moved our, our shipping stations over there and then continued to ship same day. So one of the things we thought we would do is take everything down, just kill a day, burn a day, move everything over. No, raw components, duplicate everything, finish components, get those shelves as low as possible, almost to zero. When you cross that threshold of having more stuff at the new place and fewer here, that's when this place moves over and then we move 100%. So far, it's worked beautifully. Okay, so here we are at the new shop. Now, for those of you that have tracked with our channel, you will be familiar with what this area looks like. Let me give you a quick overview. Over here, we have all of our boxes. Why? Because right over there is where all the beginning of the boxes start and we ship from right to left down to our fulfillment cart that goes to UPS at the end of the day. So we have our boxes, we have our pallets and our pro and mini system here. Then in this cell, we have all of our SmartVac series. On this shelf, we have our hot items. Those are the things most commonly ordered uh, that goes with starter packages, things like that. As we come over here, we have our Rotovice area and then raw components behind me. Now, what we've tried to do here is to duplicate our old shipping room so that we don't have to relearn new processes. Now, by doing that, we can just keep our workflow going naturally. And then while our new state-of-the-art uh, assembly and shipping room is built, then we go over there, we revisit the processes, we document them and then we follow them. It's going to be amazing. But for now, we have all of our assembly outside of this area and we pass them right through the shelves. So it's a kind of a precursor to how the new assembly and shipping room is gonna look. That's gonna be exciting. It is machinery moving day one of two. We got the guys from SoCal Machinery Movers here with a couple semis and a forklift. They're gonna start putting stuff on the beds to head to the new shop. Let's get started. The guys backed the truck in at about 7.15 this morning. It's just after 8.15, so after one hour of time, they've loaded four machines. They're just chaining them down right now. These guys are the best. Uh, next, they're gonna pull this out onto the street, bring in the second truck to pick up two more machines. Let's check that out. OK, 
Okay, uh, this is something that I've always wondered about. Quentin here is gonna show me what this is. How does this work? First of all, what are they called? We call these binders. And what a binder does is essentially, it turns this long chain into something a little shorter and tighter. So what we'll do is we'll loop it around here, leak it up, leak it up right here, it should get full. Get as tight as you can. What you want to do is you want to miss that sheet metal too. Okay. Right here, it's real close. And then we have it pulling on the other side to right here, uh -huh. and all this excess chain. So here it is, tightening it up from underneath the machine. Actually, I've tightened up on that side. Sure. And then. Then you use a breaker bar and it locks it down. We call that a cheater pipe. Cheater pipe. Okay. Cheater pipe. Yeah. So it's one chain that goes all the way through, you hook it on here, and then you use two segments of it to pull it together. Exactly. We have a loop around this way. Right. Through here. Uh-huh. The rest of it we wrap it around. Okay. Make sure CHP makes it uh make it look all nice and pretty form. Nice. CHP got it. Binder. Binder. Cool. Cheater Just pipe. Binder and a cheater pipe. Yeah. Just learned something. Cool, thanks. Okay, it is just past 1030, about three hours. We got five machines loaded up on two trucks. Uh, right now, they are going to drop off the mini mill. Now, my beloved mini mill, the machine that started it all, uh, I sold that to my guy, Jerry. He's got a side hustle rebuilding blowers for uh, motors. Um, so the mini mill is going to his shop, and then a mile away is our new shop and then they're gonna unload. So we've got a little bit of time to kill, but we still have one, two, three, four, five, maybe six machines if you include our CNC grinder and the saw still producing. So the next step is once those machines get dropped off, we're gonna put air electrical to it. Those will begin producing. Then we'll prep the other spaces for five days from now, the rest of the machines to produce. So if you look around here, we've got this machine, uh, we've had the mini mill and the VF2B that was right behind us. Um, and then of course the UMC, the Doosan Lathe 220L SYC and the 220L out of the way. It's remarkable because this shop, when we first moved in, seemed so big. And then with all these machines, it felt so small and in a weird way, it suddenly feels a little bit bigger again. Um, that's just the way it is, but wait until you see the new shop. Let's head over there. So we have all the fronts of the machines marked out with corner tapes. Corners of the machines should be right above the corner targets. Um, and close is good enough, but straight is really important. Keep going, a little bit more. Counterclockwise this way, left. Right there. Yep. Yeah, one of the things to remember is, you know, we're the customer. So if you're in the same position, don't feel pressured for, you know, your riggers to try and put your machine in a spot to make it easy for them. We will spend half an hour getting a machine straight in the right place if that's what it takes. Again, these guys are pros. Nail it the first time, good communication, everyone's happy. Okay, so that completes the moving of all the machines, part one. Remember, there's part two that happens six days from now. So we've got the UMC, the VF2 SS. Over here, we have the oldest machine, our 2015 VF2, our 2015 uh, 220 links, and then our 220 LSY links. 
So we've got some homework we need to do in the meantime. We still need to run some more conduit to these machines, to verify the drop positions. We also need to put up our airlines. Um, we didn't want to put up airlines first and then realize the conduit needs to go around it or do any crazy bends. And then the last thing we'll do is ethernet because all of our machines are networked. Um, after that, then we can move in the rest of the machines, put those in place, have the electricians come in, pull wire. Um, we're gonna stay up and running operational for the next three days. On the fourth day, we're gonna kill power, prep the machines on Friday for machining day number two, the following Monday. So if you haven't yet done so, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you catch the next episode of this moving series. And until next time, go innovate your production.